Hello again, this is part two of the NEAT 2021 Unit 3 and Unit 4 test. Uh, this is the beginning of the written response section. Question one, let's get straight into it. Okay, question one, you have an electron is traveling to the right, there it is, inside a magnetic field and inside electric, an electric field. Okay, so it's a uniform electric field E and a uniform magnetic field into the page B. Okay, so, so the electric field is going from left to right, indicated by those arrows and the X's are the magnetic field. All right. <clears throat> At any time, the fields are uniform, but their magnitude is able to be varied. All right. Gravitational effects are negligible, so we don't have to worry about gravity pulling it towards the bottom of the page. And we're doing this in space. Okay, the electron speed is that, 1 by 10 to the minus 10 to the 6. Okay, assume that the electric field is that much and the magnetic field is not even turned on, right? because it's zero. Determine the magnitude of the net force on the electron to show your working world. You don't have to worry about the magnetic field. Okay, so the electric field. The force on an object of a certain charge in an electric field is that. Just multiply those two together. Uh, the electric field was 1 by 10 to the 6. Charge is 1 by 1.6 by 10 to the minus 19. They multiply to that. That's the answer. All you have to say. Okay, part B. <clears throat> Let me get that. Okay, now you assume that the electric field is turned off and B is turned on to two Teslas. So now you don't have to worry about that. You have to do this. So this question is literally just testing whether you understand how to use and when to use these formulas. Okay, so that's pretty much all it's doing. The charge, the velocity, the magnetic field strength of two, that's what you get. Okay, say these bits, right? Just for the sake of the five seconds it takes to write that, write them in your answer. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. Part B2. Sorry, wrote C there. Part B2. Explain using physics principles the resulting motion of the electron while it remains in the region of magnetic field B. Um, and it says explain using physics principles. Um, you actually don't have to explain much here. You just have to say that it's in a circular path going clockwise. Um, you don't necessarily have to say why, but the, but the reason, um, the explanation is that the force on it is always at right angles to its motion, right? The right hand rule sort of dictates that. Um, and the, the definition of circular motion is when something is moving in one direction and being forced at right angles to its motion. That always results in a circular, in a circular path. Okay, and you can use the right hand rule, sorry, pardon me, the left hand rule, because it's an electron, to figure out that it's going to go clockwise in a circle. And that's as much explanation as you need for that one. Part C, they're using the answers to part A and part B, that and that. So they're saying when they're both turned on, what is the magnitude of the resultant force? Now, it only says magnitude, so don't bother figuring out the direction, right? Don't. There's no extra points for extra stuff, so don't do it. Magnitude only. So 1.6 there, electric field that way, magnetic field this way. Um, do the maths, Pythagoras' theorem, find the value of R. That's all you have to do. Pretty quick question, that one. Question two, when you start talking about orbital periods and radii of orbit, you're, you're starting to talk about Kepler's third law, especially if we're out in space with a satellite or a moon or something like that. All right, so they have basically given you, uh, where are we? They've given you the orbital period of something that's going around the Earth, and they're saying, figure out what the altitude must be, right? There's one way to do that, and that's this, Kepler's third law. All right, orbital period, put it in there, and you get the radius. Now, G is on the data sheet. The M is the mass of the Earth. It's the mass of the thing that's in the middle of the circle. It's not the mass of the object that's going around. There's only one M here. So if they told you that it weighs, and sometimes they'll do this to you, right? If they told you that this satellite weighs three and a half tons or something, that doesn't get into this formula. That is the mass of the Earth, which again is on the physics data sheet, right? They, they give that to you. If they don't give it to you in the question, it'll be on the data sheet. No one expects you to remember how heavy the Earth is. We probably expect you to remember the value of pi, or at least to remember that your calculator has a pi button, I reckon that's fair enough. Um, and the other thing to, is to worry about is the units here, right? The period has to be in seconds. Every time in physics is measured in seconds and every distance is measured in meters. So when you get the answer, the answer is going to be in meters. All right.
Okay, so the satellite was moved to a new stable orbit of a greater altitude, so it's going around in a bigger circle. Explain what effect this has on the speed of the satellite. Notice that it didn't say calculate, right? So don't put calculations in here. This is an explanation. They're not testing your ability to calculate something. So don't do it. Do what the question says, as always. <clears throat> so you can use a formula, absolutely, but don't calculate. Right? So because this is the formula to find the velocity right, um, of something that's orbiting under its own steam, um, the greater the r is, the less the velocity is. So a bigger radius means a smaller means a smaller velocity. The other way to explain this is that at a bigger radius, the force that's that's holding it in the circle becomes less. Right, the force of gravity becomes less if you're further away from the Earth, and so the centri the centripetal force is less, and therefore the velocity must be less to make sure that it stays in orbit and doesn't sort of spiral out of control. Either of those explanations is fine, but they're the points you need to make. Question three. Okay, rectangular coil connected to a DC battery. All right, so this is a motor. It's not a generator. It's getting electricity and it's making movement. All right. Um, and they told us that it's going in that direction. I knew that it was, it was there somewhere. Okay, diagram. Again, have a look at a good look at the diagram. Don't miss anything. I nearly missed this. Right. It's rotating clockwise. And the question says, label these as north and south. Right. Which way are the magnetic field lines going? Um, okay, well, the way I did it is the left side has to be moving up because the left side has to go up for the whole thing to be going clockwise. Right. And I basically right-hand ruled it. Right. <clears throat> so the right-hand rule gives the magnetic field lines have to be right to left for that to be occurring. Right. Um, here's how I would say it, right? thumb along the wire, magnetic field lines have to be going that way for my hand to be pushing up out of the page. Right? You don't have to explain it to that level, you just have to say what I've said here. The right hand rule gives B lines, magnetic field lines going right to left, therefore south on the left side. This is only worth one mark, right? so you don't have to do any of that, I'm just doing this for you. You just have to write south, north. If they said explain your answer, then you would have to write that. But this is enough of an explanation. If that was a three mark question that said justify your choice, that's enough justification. That's you've joined the gaps. So you don't have to write half a page of explanation. That is good enough. That's full marks. OK. OK, part B, a standard sort of calculating question here. They gave you a whole pile of figures. You will write down the list of, of quantities as per the last two years of me teaching you. Um, and you'll figure out, they've asked you for how many turns the coil, the coil must have if it's going to experience a force of 0.32 newtons. This is the formula for the force on, <clears throat> excuse me, for the force on a rotating loop in a magnetic field. Number of turns, magnetic field, current in the wires, length of the wire that's in, that's uh, crossing the lines of magnetic field. Right. They gave you everything. You know how to do this. All right. Solve for n, n equals 40 turns. Okay, part C um, has a particular word here, apparatus. Right? Suggest two modifications that could be made to the apparatus, to the machinery, right? in figure two that would cause the coil to turn more slowly. There are lots of options. Right? Um, you could lower the strength of the magnetic field. However, that's not changing the apparatus. So the way to do that would be to move these things apart. Right? And that would... Uh, that would lower the strength of the, ma the magnetic field strength in the middle. Right? So you have to write it in, you have to phrase it as a change to the apparatus. You can't say, you can't just say give it more current. You can say replace the battery with a battery that would supply more current because that's changing the apparatus. Right? You, <coughs> excuse me, you can say replace the loop with a loop made out of a wire that has more resistance. There are quite a few things you, you can do. Um, you can put more resistance here. You can add a resistor to this external circuit to lower the voltage that this thing gets in the first place. There are quite a few things to do, but you have to phrase them as a change to the apparatus. Right? This is the piece that I would change, and here's how I, how I would change it. You can't just say, give it more voltage. You have to change the apparatus. For this one, have a particular look at the answers that were supplied by me. Go to, go to the solutions document, because they gave you about seven or eight different options there, quite a few. Um, and you only need two. So get to know two or three, that'll be fine. Question four. This is a monstrous question. This is a very nasty question. 
a whole page of stuff to read through first before you even get to the question. I'm just going to move this across a little bit. There you go, that's a bit better. So, here's the situation. <clears throat> the initial position um, of the magnetic field is upwards. Okay, so, this is the, the situation. We've got a magnet hanging on the end of a spring. It's drawn down, <clears throat> excuse me, and then let go. And it's drawn down so that it's within range of this solenoid here, this coil of wires. And as long as it isn't moving, that needle is going to say zero. A changing magnetic field will make it flicker, right? And of course, as soon as we let go of this and it shoots up, it's going to be a changing magnetic field. There is, um, this wire coil here is now in a magnetic field because the North Pole is sending its magnetic field lines out in this way and they're going through the wires, but it isn't moving at the moment. As soon as this goes, it's going to be a moving magnetic field. There are a few ways to explain what the hell happens. I've decided to give an explanation that's not the same as the NEEP solutions book explanation. So between me and NEEP, you've now got two ways to sort this out. So I'm going to go through mine. <coughs> I've literally used Lenz's law. All right. So the initial motion of the magnetic field is upwards, of course, because we let go of this thing and it shoots up because it's on, a, on the end of a spring. So that will induce another magnetic field in this thing, right, in that, in that coil. I'm going to reverse to, refer to this version of the drawing. Uh, that in, induced magnetic field will try to stop the motion that began it. Right? This is what Lenz's law basically said. An, indu an induced current will create a magnetic field which will try to oppose the motion of the magnetic field that made the current in the first place. That's literally what Lenz's law does. Right? So that magnetic field was moving up. So this new green magnetic field is going to try to pull it back down. It's going to try to do the opposite of what's causing it in, to, in the first place. So in order, in order for another magnet there to try to pull this down, that's got to be a south pole because the north has to be attracted back down to the south. It's not going to succeed in pulling it down, but it will mean that it goes up a little more slowly and it will mean that the current here is a little bit less than you would calculate it to be. Uh, that's why... That's what Lenz's law explains. That's the observation that Lenz's law explains. So for that to be a south and that to be a north, right, you then use your right hand rule and point, <clears throat> excuse me, and I've said it here, using the right hand screw rule, your hand in a fist like this, your thumb points from south to north like that. And we're looking at the green one here. Right. For that coil to make that magnet, right, you point your thumb from south to north because inside the magnet, the magnetic field lines are going from south to north. Outside, they're going from north to south. So south to north, and your fingers curl around in the direction of conventional current in that coil. And looking across at the original picture, which is a little bit clearer than mine, um, to coil that, that away, in other words, to be going clockwise if viewed from above, um, that, that means conventional current would have to be going out of X and into Y. So it goes in at Y and out of X, and therefore the needle would move left because they told you in their preamble that if it goes in at Y and out of X, the needle moves left. Um, that is a tough question. A page of diagrams and information to take in, and then you turn that over and there's a four-mark question with half a page of lines on it. That is a nightmare. I totally understand it. I feel your pain. Okay, on to part B, sketching the curve. Here's, here's what the answer should look like, and here's why. <clears throat> okay, so the magnet oscillates between being there and going up. It goes like this, just oscillating like that. Um, and uh, thereafter, the graph of the current that's going to be created. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So the current has been measured all the way along and graphed in real time. It started at zero. Uh, before it started moving, it wasn't going, right? And also, if this is the lowest point in the oscillation, that's also the zero point while it's moving. So it goes up and then stops. It goes down and then stops. And so that point there is the zero point anyway. And halfway up, that will be the maximum velocity. And then it starts slowing down and then stops, turns around. Halfway down, it'll be maximum the other direction. And it'll stop there. And then that's one cycle. Okay. So it does start at zero. 
the answer scheme quite rightly didn't say you had to go down and then up or up and then down either was fine because they didn't put plus or minus on this thing so there was no real way to say you know which way was conventionally taken to be positive or negative so it was fine um what you did have to have to figure out is that one full cycle took one second okay because the time it took the magnet to go between figure three sorry and figure four was half a second and that's from down at the bottom to up the top is half of one complete rotation or one complete oscillation pardon me so you had to label this you had to do two cycles they told you two cycles um, you had to get the scale correct one second two seconds and you had to start at, at the origin that's where you got your three marks okay here's question five a circular coil of wire six turns four centimeter diameter is connected to a voltmeter there's a magnet near it and the magnet is pulled away at a constant speed <clears throat> over a certain amount of time the magnetic field strength goes from what it used to be, which is 0.2, down to zero when the magnet is out of range. Show that the flux experienced by the coil for the position shown is that. Okay, flux is magnetic field strength times area. Right? Uh, for, and I said for the position shown. That's the position shown, so that's the maximum. Okay, so the magnetic field strength is 0.2. So that's where you get the 0.2 from, from the graph. Right? And the area is pi r squared. Just be careful you don't put four for the radius. That's the diameter. So put two for the radius. And again, it's in centimeters. Got to be converted to meters. So it's 0 0.02 squared. So it's pi r squared. Calculate that. It comes to 2.5 by 10 to the minus 4, just like they said. Part B, find the magnitude of the average EMF. I'm glad they didn't say direction because that's a bit more painful. Um, experienced by the coil <clears throat> as the magnet is pulled away. Okay. Excuse me. Okay, EMF is the rate of change of flux multiplied by how many turns are in the coil. Okay, so this is d flux d time. That's the rate of change of anything. And it's d it d time. All right. So n is six six turns in the coil. Um, it changes from two point five by ten to the minus four to zero in one and a half seconds. Grab your calculator, find out the answer. That's what it comes to. And here's another question where the wording is very specific here. Part C suggests two modifications that could be made to the apparatus, and they even put apparatus in bold, right? shown in figure five, using the same magnet. So you're not changing the magnet. You can only change some of the other bits, like the coil. There you go. You can only change this. Right? You can change something about the wire, something about the circuit, something about the voltmeter. That's pretty much all you can do. So apparatus using the same magnet that would enable the coil to experience a greater EMF as the magnet is removed. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you can't say pull the magnet out faster. That would work because that would make this bigger. That would make this better, right? D flux DT would be a higher number. You can't do that though, unfortunately. You can make the flux bigger though. You can, <clears throat> excuse me, you can change the area, right? The, if the area is bigger, the flux will be bigger. So the starting flux will be a larger figure. So you can make a larger loop. You can also increase the amount of turns. So they are the two obvious things that you can, that you can do. And in, this, and in this particular case, there really isn't much else. I guess the other thing you could, you could say is, uh, you know, replace the wire with wire that had less resistance or something like that. But that's, that's a very minor thing. The two obvious ones they were looking for is increase the area or increase the N. Um, as far as the apparatus is concerned, there's nothing else you can do. Question six. Okay. There's a big fat diagram here. Stop everything and just look at the diagram. If you don't understand what the diagram is, then yes, absolutely read this stuff first, right? Uh, I'm assuming you know what this diagram is though. Um, these are transformers. This is a, a, skept a sort of a simplified diagram of uh, an electric, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, of electric lines that are powering, that are taking electricity from a power source to something that's going to use it. And it's being transformed up and then it's being transformed down. Okay. So things you need to get out of this. These are the transformer ratios, one to 10. So that's just got, there are 10 times as many turns on that coil as there are on this coil. And this is the other way around, right? 
you also need to know that that is RMS voltage. So if they ask you for peak voltage or peak to peak voltage, we have to do another calculation. Right? Uh, and if you put 12 volts into a formula to find out a voltage over here, the voltage you're finding out will be RMS. Okay, so just keep all that stuff in mind. <clears throat> right, let's get into it. Have a read. Group of students conducted a model of a long distance transmission. Yep, the long distance wiring has a total resistance of 5 ohms. That's that side and that side adds up to 5 ohms. The circuit consists of an ideal transformer. In other words, no power is lost from one, from one side to the other at the beginning and at the end. All right. Uh, the transformer terminals are labeled P, Q, R, and S. All right. The voltage across the globe is 11.5 volts RMS. Okay, so they're speaking the same language at least. Determine the potential difference across PR. Okay, so if you put a voltmeter across there, right, and across QS. All right, let's do this. PR is fairly easy. <clears throat> Um, it's a 1 to 10 transformer, so the voltage that was over here is going to be multiplied by 10. So it's going to be 120 volts. So that's what I did over here. 10 times 12 volts, 120 volts. Um, they were ideal transformers. No power has been lost yet. Right. Done. Okay. Same over here. The shortcut here is to go from the globe out here. Okay. So <clears throat> the globe, uh, where I the voltage across the globe is 11.5 volts. So if you put a voltmeter across here you're going to get 11.5 and again this transformer it has 10 times as much voltage on that side of it as it does on this side of it so you can just go 11.5 times 10 which is 115 so that's what i've done here now part b determine the power supplied to the globe this is a little bit more work because this will involve current power is v times i so here's what we're going to do about this for that long distance line, we can figure out what the current must have been. Because going from P to Q, <clears throat> you lost 5 volts. It had 120, and then it had 115 over here. That's what these two answers told you. There's a difference of 5 there. Okay, There's a resistance of 5 as well. So using V equals IR, you go I equals V divided by R, 5 divided by 5, the current must have been 1 amp. So the current in the long distance section was 1 amp. Okay. So for the globe, <clears throat> you can now transform this. If a transformer transforms voltage down, if it's, step, if it's a step-down transformer, because electricity is going this way, right, then this transformer steps down the voltage by a factor of 10, but it steps up the current by a factor of 10. So current of 1 amp over here is going to be a current of 10 amps on this side. Right? That's what I've done over here, 10 amps. So finally, you know the current through the globe. So now over to the globe, power equals VI, voltage of the globe, current of the globe. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's 11.5 times 10, 115 watts. Okay, question seven. It's very likely you're going to get a question like this. We've, we've seen this sort of question in just about every um, practice exam we've done. This is no exception. The old roller coaster question. <clears throat> it's a very standard one. Okay, a car, toy car of mass 20 grams, starts from rest, so it isn't moving there, right? heads down, right? ends up rolling down under its own steam. It doesn't have an engine, so it's just relying on gravitational potential energy. They give you some figures, heights there, heights there, heights there, Think point A, crest. Okay, determine the speed of the toy car when it reaches point A. This is a conservation of energy question. Right? Um, the, the gravitational potential energy that it has there is the total amount of energy that it's, all, that it's ever going to have. As it goes down, it loses gravitational potential and gains kinetic. But the total is going to be the same all the way along. So whatever joules of potential energy it's got there, it's going to have just that much kinetic energy down there when it doesn't have any other form of energy. Right? So determine the speed of a toy car when it reaches point A. This is how to do it. The energy at the start equals the energy at point A, right? And the energy at the start is just MGH, right? It's mass, again, put it in, sorry, I won't be using that finger again. <laughs> the mass, put it in kilograms, 9.8, 2.2, which is the height, that's MG and H. Now, at point A, it's got a bit of both. It's got kinetic energy, half MV squared, and it's, and it's got gravitational potential energy. Solve that for V, and you get 5.8 meters per second. All right. Part B, 
does the toy car leave the track at the top of the crest? Now, this one is interesting. So I just want to show you another little picture I've got here. Now, I've said this in a previous question. It was one of the multiple choice questions, I think. This formula here, F equals mv squared on R. That's how much force it takes to keep something in a circular path. Right? That doesn't tell you what's actually doing that job. It just tells you how much that job needs to be done. Right? In this particular case of a car, change, of a car going over a hill, what's giving it that mv squared on r is gravity. The only reason that this thing is hugging the, the road here as it goes over a circular hill is because it's on planet Earth and it's not in space. <coughs> Excuse me. It's, in, it's got gravity pulling it down, pulling it down all the way. Okay. So that's the source of it. Now, this question said, just make it over the hill. Okay. The, the, the actual wording is uh, described. Does the toy track leave the track? Uh, sorry. Does the toy car leave the track at the top of the crest? Okay. So we're going to have to find out the point at which it would just stay on or just leave. Right? So normally if a car goes over a, cr a crest slowly, right? As per normal and doesn't leave the road, right? Just goes out, drives over a hill and everything's cool. That just means that the amount of force needed to keep it in that circular path was about that much and gravity was about that much. So of course it was going to be held in its circular path, right? It was way enough. Right? However, the faster you go over a hill, the faster that V is, the more force you need, right? the bigger that's going to be. So if you go back and go over the same hill again faster, this stays the same. This is gravity. That stays the same. But this one gets a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. Right? This is what you need to stay on the road. Right? And the faster you go, the more force you need to be pulling you down onto the road as you go over the hill. And there comes a point where you need more than there is. And that's when you're going to leave. That's when you're going to start flying. Right? That's when rally cars fly over bumps and they land 10 meters later. Okay? So we're looking at the point at which these two are the same, at which the gravity just happens to equal what is needed. And that will just make it leave the road. It'll just leave the road for like one centimeter and then bang back down. Okay. And that's why I've got this over here, right? To just stay on the road, mv squared on r has to equal mg. So this is what we're talking about. The, the sort of point of no return, any faster and you're going to leave. The m's cancel out because they're both the mass of the car. <clears throat> and you end up getting v squared over r equals g or v equals the square root of rg. Okay. So the velocity at which it will just leave the road is this, right? So then yeah, that's the radius, that's G and it equals 2.21 meters per second. That is the fastest that you could go over that particular hill in this question and not leave the road. Okay. So, but it is traveling at 5.8 meters per second because we figured that out in part A. Right? So this question was, does it leave the track? Right? It would leave the track if it's going faster than 2.21. It's going way faster than 2.21. So, yep, it's going to leave the road. That is how to do it. And that's sort of the physics and the understanding behind it. Now, question eight is actually a little bit easier than it looks. There's figure nine. It says it shows a ball of mass 0.08 kilograms traveling around a horizontal circular path at a constant speed. Right? Not a constant velocity because it's always changing direction, but a constant speed. Right? While suspended from the ceiling by a meter of string. The radius of the circle is r. Isn't that the most useless sentence? The radius of the circle is the radius. The, st the string is at an angle of 20 degrees to the center of the circular path. The period of rotation is 1.95 seconds. Okay. Determine the speed of the ball. Show your working. <clears throat> okay. Um, speed, velocity is, dis is displacement over time, right? Speed is distance over time. So you can just use this. Okay. Um, the time is the period of rotation. So we're going to do this for one lap, right? Assuming this thing is doing one lap, the time is 1.95 seconds, right? And the distance it's going to go is one of those circles. So you have to find what the number for R is. And that's why we've got this triangle over here. 
if that's one meter, that's 20 degrees, and that's R, right? R equals one times the sine of 20, which is 0.342 meters. So circumference of a circle is two pi R. So now we can go two times pi times 3.42, which is what I've done. Right? So velocity is displacement over time, and it comes to 1.1 meter per second. Now they said speed because they didn't tell you what particular direction it was going in at any particular place. They weren't all that worried about it. They just, they didn't want you to worry about velocity, which would have included a direction, right? Question nine, projectile motion, everyone's favorite. I know you can't see all of this when it's going off the page, but I told you to have your own copy in front of you. So get your own copy in front of you. And I've blown up the diagram here anyway, so we can play with it. Okay, <clears throat> let's get into this. I know a lot of people uh, a little bit scared of projectile motion, so we're going to sort of do this nice and slowly. All right, <clears throat> so it's a golf ball. A golf ball is hit maybe off the top of a cliff or off a hill, um, and it follows that trail, lands on a piece of ground that was lower than its takeoff point. Okay. What we know is that it went horizontally 2.35 metres, so it wasn't much of a shot. Um, and when it landed it was moving horizontally at 1.5 meters per second. And at the same time, it was losing altitude at 9.5 meters per second, right? So it was nearly going vertical. It was going a lot more vertical than horizontal, um, but they are the horizontal and vertical components of its final velocity. <clears throat> so that's what we know. And part A says, show that the time the ball spends in the air is approximately 1.57 seconds. Now, have a look at this up here. If that is not on your cheat sheet, you're an idiot. Put it on your cheat sheet, really. <clears throat> you need these. The only formula for horizontal motion in projectile motion is that one, right? Because there is no sideways acceleration of something that is falling through the, through the air. The only force on it is gravity. And so nothing is, accelerates it left or right. So it's a constant velocity. So this is a horizontal question. Show that the time the ball spends in the air is approximately 1.57 seconds. Okay, <clears throat> we can do that straight away with this. So we don't need to worry about any of this garbage. All right, because we've got 2.35, we've got the S, and they gave us the answer to the question, 1.57. We just have to show that that's right. Okay, <clears throat> and we've also got the horizontal velocity. So velocity is dis displacement over time. Juggle it around, put the numbers in, displacement over velocity, those two figures equals 1.57 seconds. Excellent. Right. And it's worth putting that there. Right. Or it's worth writing this, right on V subscript H, S subscript H, to show that, you're, that you know that you're doing horizontal stuff. Right. This also really reminds you to not put any vertical figures in. Right. You're not going to see that 9.5 in this question. You're not going to see that 1.5 in a vertical question. The worst thing you can do is mix these two things up. You're only ever using one of them. Okay, so that's part A. <clears throat> and it says determine the launch speed of the ball. <coughs> Pardon me. The launch speed is how fast it took off in that direction at the beginning of its journey. So that vector there is the vector of its launch speed. We don't even know its landing speed. We know its components of its landing speed. But we do know a couple of things about this already. We know that its launch speed horizontally is 1.5 meters per second because horizontally there's no acceleration, so the velocity is the same. Right, so we know that part. We don't know this bit. So we need to do a vertical calculation to find that. That's U. That's the U of this V, right? Remember in vertical, there's a, an initial velocity and a final velocity, that's U, that's V. We have to find out what U is. So here's what we know vertically. U, we don't know. A is negative 9.8. Now, pluses and, matter, and minuses matter here because there is an up and there is a down. So that's gonna be plus and that's gonna be minus. All right. <clears throat> which means this is a negative as well. That's the classic mistake that people are gonna make. They're gonna do everything right in this question, but they're gonna forget that that's actually down and that has to be put in the formula as a negative or you're not gonna get an answer that makes any sense. So velocity, so the final velocity of the ball vertically is negative 9.5 meters per second. 
time is that time is no long is neither vertical nor horizontal it's the only thing that isn't it can go across to both all right so we just have to pick one of those that will do this you've got u a t v first one v equals u plus a t <coughs> and again be very paranoid about putting the negatives exactly where they belong negative 9.5 equals u plus negative a times t all right do all the algebra correctly and you should get 5.89 meters per second so that number up there is 5.89 so the launch speed is that blue one so we need to combine these two we need to add those two vectors in two dimensions to figure out what that is and it's pythagoras isn't it so you're going to go 1.5 and 5.89 and you're going to find the blue one and that's r which is why I've done this. So the resultant equals VH squared. Oh, I'm sorry. I just realized you weren't watching what I was doing. <clears throat> sorry. So it's going to be that 1.5, that 5.89, horizontal, vertical, and this is the R you're trying to find. Right? So using Pythagoras, which is right here, um, and I've just put it in there, and you've got 6.1 meters per second, and that's the answer. Question 10. Okay. A toy cart of mass 100 grams oh has got a spring-loaded launch mechanism. A steel ball of mass 20 grams is loaded into it, and the cart ball system is shown there. Okay. The spring has a spring constant of 800. It's compressed by one centimeter right, with the ball against it. The cart ball system is stationary. The whole thing is not moving. Right? This is a graph of energy versus spring displacement. So as you compress the spring, the energy in the spring goes up like this. Okay. And again, stop and have a look at it, right? It's in joules. It's not in megajoules or millijoules or something, right? That's in meters. That's handy. Okay. So, and 0.01, that's the one centimeter. Okay. So it's depressed. It's compressed by one centimeter at its maximum. So it doesn't get compressed anymore. All right. We got that. The spring is released so that the ball is projected. So the ball is going to go one way, the cart's going to go the other. Right? Um, both the cart and the spring move. As the spring expands, no energy is released as heat or sound. In other words, it all turns into kinetic energy of the ball. Right? So on the graph above, you've got to draw the graph of kinetic energy of the cart ball system right? as the spring expands from one centimeter compression to its unloaded length. All right. So again, this is a conservation of energy question. The total amount of energy of the whole thing is going to stay the same. Right? So as the strain potential energy of the spring, the elastic potential energy, goes down from its maximum to zero, the kinetic energy is going to go up from zero to its maximum. Now they've drawn it the other way here. Right? Um, so the spring is going to go from that from that compression to zero compression. So it's going to go short. The energy goes like that, right? Um, so we're going to sort of draw it backwards. But <clears throat> you've seen what I've done down here. Let me just center this a little. There you go. So you've seen what I've done down here. This is a terrible drawing. But <clears throat> that line and the line that you draw have to literally be vertical mirrors of each other because at any point the total amount of energy has to add up to the same thing okay so if i add that and that i'll get there if i add that and that it should also come to the same total right? the total amount of energy that's available is this many joules whatever that value is we don't know it yet but that and that should add up to this, right? So the total, if you if there was a green graph of total energy, it should be a horizontal line because the total energy doesn't change. The only way to do that is to draw this particular line here. It's a vertical flip, right? It's a vertical reflection of the line that was already there. Okay. They also said include a scale for the y-axis in joules. Now, I've sort of calculated that over here. So the maximum elastic potential energy, this is the formula for elastic potential energy. Again, it's on the formula sheet, I think. If it isn't, put it in your cheat sheet. If you don't understand it, put an explanation on your cheat sheet. Do that. Okay. Um, so it's a half times the spring constant, which they gave us, times the displacement, which they gave us. It was one centimeter. Okay. So when it's one centimeter, that height there has to be 0.04 joules. So over here, 
I'm going to write 0.04 joules. And so down here, I'm going to write 0.02. They said do a scale. Now, um, they've already labeled the scale there, so you don't have to put a label on it, but you did have to do this. Right. 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.03, 0 0.04. That's what I meant. And part B basically says what I've just told you. It says explain using physics principles your reasoning for the scale for the y-axis chosen. You're not explaining your curve. You're explaining these numbers. All right. So this is literally the explanation that you need to give. Okay. You knew, <clears throat> excuse me, you had all of the figures to get the maximum amount of energy that was stored in the spring and it came to 0 0.04 joules so that must be 0 0.04 joules and if that's 0 0.04 then that's 0 0.03 0 0.02 0 0.01 zero that's all you have to say question 11 things are colliding so it's going to be a momentum question whenever there's a collision especially if two things stick together after they've collided it is absolutely a momentum question all right so this was these two carts both going the same way, which is like, which is nice. That makes it simpler because there are, no, there are no pluses and minuses to this. Everything's going in one direction. Right? Um, so this one's going to catch up and hit it, and they're going to stick together. Okay. And it says, determine the speed of the coupled cars immediately after they couple. Show you're working. This is another very standard physics question that turns up in just about every test you, you're going to get. All right. Momentum before equals momentum after, right? Momentum is conserved in collisions. So momentum is MV. So before you had MV for the car, MV for the truck. This is their masses, that's their velocities. Right? Um, add all that up. And afterwards, the two of them added up to a mass of 3.5 kilograms and they were going at an unknown velocity. Right? Solve that equation for V and that's the answer. Very straightforward. That's, that's basically, if you can't do that one, you're going to fail. No, you're not. Okay, question 12, one of my favorite bits of physics, relativity. This is freaky stuff. All right, a spacecraft is traveling from Earth to somewhere else that's 10.2 light years away, as measured by scientists on Earth. The spacecraft travels at 0.7 C, and according to Earthlings, the trip is going to take 13.6 years. Part A says... Will the measuring instruments on the spacecraft record a greater, equal, or lesser time than 13.6 years? Right. Um, explain your, your answer. Don't provide calculations. So if they say that, if they say do not provide calculations, especially if they put the not in bold, and you do it, they're not going to read them. Right. They're, not even, they're certainly not going to mark them. They're not even going to read them. Right. So don't. Total waste of time. Okay, so here's the way to go. Firstly, answer the question. Right. More time, equal time, less time, less time. By the way, again, this is a full marks answer, right? You don't have to do flowery sentences. I know they gave you like nine lines to answer the question, but this is a full marks answer. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it's going to take less time. And the reason for that is that according to the people on the spacecraft, the distance to the destination is contracted at relativistic speed. So they're going to look, so they're going to be here in their spacecraft looking over here at the planet. At the, the way they're going, their destination. As soon as they get up to their relativistic speed, the, the, the area of space in front of them is going to go like that. It's going to contract. This is length contraction. So they're going to go, oh my God, we don't have to go as far now. We're going to take so much less time to do it. Right? When they look at their clocks, their clocks are going to look like they're still just ticking along at one, two, three. Right? They're not going to look like their time is slowed down. Right? Everything in their ship is going to feel normal to them. So the clocks in their ship are going to be ticking normally, according to them. Right? It's just that the universe outside the window has shrunk, so they don't have to drive as far. So it's look. So you know, once when they get there, when they get here, having thought they had to go over there, of course they've taken less time to do it. Right? So that's basically what I've said here. The distance to the destination is contracted at relativistic speeds. Therefore, the spacecraft has less distance to cover at the same speed. By the way, if I ask you the other question, I'll just give you the, the explanation from Earth's perspective. Right. Excuse me, I have a phone call. Right, sorry about that interruption. Where was I? Puppy! <clears throat> Excuse me. Determine the kinetic energy of the spacecraft as it travels to, a star, to the star system. Show your working. Here's the working. All right, there's the formula for kinetic energy, relativistic. It's going at a relativistic speed, so you can't use a half mv squared. You've got to use this one. 
If they didn't tell you, it should be obvious enough by now. They gave you the Lorentz factor, 1.51, so it's pretty easy to do. Easy enough, okay? 2.3 by 10 to the 23 joules. And I've just realized what I was interrupted <clears throat> by the phone. Uh, I was halfway through telling you how to answer this question. If they, are, if they asked you why the, less, why the less time was happening from Earth's perspective. From the perspective of Earth, that distance stays the same, of course, because Earth isn't moving relative to that distance, to that, to that space, okay? The only thing that's moving is the rocket, okay? Um, the thing that's different from Earth, right? So we're going to calculate that it's going to take 13.6 years to, to do the trip. The thing that's going to, going to change from Earth is that if the Earthlings can have a look at the clock on the spaceship, they will realize that the clock on the spaceship is ticking slowly. So they will realize that when the spaceship gets over here, the spaceship's slower than normal moving clock will only say six years instead of 10.2 years. Right? From the perspective of the spaceship, there's nothing wrong with the clock at all. There's something wrong with the distance. And that's why it only took six years instead of 10.2. Okay? Just thought I'd let you know. Question 13, getting through this pretty well. Okay. Figure 14 shows the position of a progressive transverse wave for a particular instant in time as measured by its position. It's going to the right at 6 metres per second. All right. What is the period of the wave? <clears throat> the period of the wave is how long it takes one wave to go past. Uh, so I can already tell it's going to be half a second. So I've done the calculations over here, but this is where my meaning is. Again, I've had, I'm having a good look at this. Okay. Um, so... It's moving to the right at 6 metres per second. Um, this is its position, so the wavelength of the waves is 3 metres. So that's one full wave, and it's 3 metres. Next one is 6, next one is 9. It's a 3 metre long wave. Right? So 6 metres per second means that that bit is going to be there in one second. So it is going to be two waves across in one second. Right? So it moves that much stuff along. So if you're standing here at the 6 second mark, uh, after one more second, this bit is going to be where you are, right? So that means that this one wave and that one wave will have gone past you in one second, right? So if, so if two waves go past in one second, that's the frequency, one wave will go past in half a second. So you can either use that logic or you can just do the calculations like this. Velocity is just dis distance over time, displacement over time, pardon me, right? <clears throat> excuse me, which is 6 metres per second. I've just rearranged it. Time, it was displacement over velocity. Uh, how, how long does it take to go 3 metres if you're travelling 6 metres a second, given that one of the waves is 3 metres? Right? Half a second. So there's a couple of ways to do that. You can show that working, or you can explain it in words. Either way is fine. <clears throat> okay. On figure 14, sketch the position of one cycle of the wave. And again... Do one. It says one. It's put it in bold. Um, however, the I note with interest that the answers to this actually shows more than one cycle of the wave. So the answer that they gave you um, in the solutions is actually incorrect. It would have got one out of two. So one cycle. We're going to do one cycle. I'm going to draw it on this. <clears throat> because I didn't draw it on this. Okay. 0.25 seconds later than the instant shot. Okay, well, after one second, it goes six metres, right? It travels at six metres per second, right? So it'll travel one and a half metres in a quarter of a second because one and a half is a quarter of six. And from there to there is one and a half. So that bit will now be there. And this bit will now be here. So that pink is my answer. That's the one cycle. <clears throat> Excuse me. Question 14. A couple of loudspeakers, excuse me, are able to play the same notes simultaneously using the same power output. In other words, they're in phase waves. Okay. Zara stands in front of the speakers. Uh, a and B are the two distances that she is from the speakers. That's how far those distances are, 5.4 and 3.8. The speed of sound in air is 340 metres per second. All right. At a particular time, L1 and L2 play a note of a frequency 850 hertz at the same time. 
<clears throat> excuse me, compare how Zara would perceive the intensity of the sound from both speakers with the intensity of the sound from speaker L1 only. So if L2 was off, right, what would she hear? And then when you turn L2 on and she's in that particular spot, would it be any different? Would it be louder or softer? Okay. So you need to figure out what the path difference is. And I've done that. Um, the path that the sound takes from L1 is 5.4. From L2, it's 3.8. That minus that, this is what I've done over here, is 1.6 meters. Okay. <clears throat> the wavelength is the velocity divided by the frequency. Right? That's from velocity equals frequency times wavelength, um, which is 0.4 meters. So the path difference is a whole number of, one of those. The path difference is exactly four wavelengths. Any time the path difference is a whole number of wavelengths, at that spot, you're going to get in-phase constructive interference. So Zara is experiencing constructive interference at that time. Uh, so the crest of one is going to be arriving at Zara along with the crest of the other, and they are going to add their amplitudes, and that's going to be loud. Right. So she's getting constructive interference, so the sound is going to be louder from L1 and L2 than it would have been from L1 only. Right. If you turn off one of those, you're going to get half as much sound. So she's in a loud spot. <clears throat> so that's literally the understanding. Okay, It's four marks. It's a reasonably big question because there's a, a lot of little things to do here. Okay, Find the path difference. Find the wavelength. Establish that the, way, that the path difference is a whole number of wavelengths. It's not something and a half. And then say, well, that's constructive interference, so it's going to be louder. Right? It's a lot, a lot of little steps to that one. <clears throat> now, Zara now moves to a new distance. So that A is six metres. She is still closer to speaker L2 than she is to L1. The note played by the speakers changes to a note of wavelength 0.75 metres. Zara is now barely to able to hear a thing. And I'll tell you why she doesn't hear nothing in a minute, but she is barely able to hear a sound. Determine a possible value for distance B. Right. So she's experiencing destructive interference. So the, poss the possible path differences, it has to be something and a half wavelengths. Right? Half a wavelength, one and a half, two and a half, three and a half, four and a half, whatever. They just said one possible, so, you know, pick the easy one. Right? Half a wavelength. The wavelength is 0.75 metres, so half of 0.75 metres is 0.375 metres. So one possible, so, you know, that's one possible path difference. So she is six metres away from one of them, right? Uh, the, the distance A, sorry, the, the line marked A was six metres. And so one possible value that she could be away from B is 6 minus 0.375, which is 5.625. Pretty straightforward. The reason she doesn't experience zero um, sound is because once these things are, once these sound waves are hitting the walls around her, they're also bouncing off the walls around her and still going into her ears. So she will still hear sound, right? but uh, she'll be in a much quieter seat than she was in previously. 15, this is a bit of a scary one. Explain why the term resonant frequencies is used to refer to musical notes produced by plucking a, a guitar string. Uh, again, I've drawn, I've done a slightly different answer to the, the solution that Neat gave you, just so that you could have a couple of difference, differences. Um, this is worth three marks. There's, two, there's three or four things you've got to say. Here. Firstly, these are basically the, the essential points. A plucked string has got waves traveling along it in both directions. Right? So if you could slow it down to an ultra slow motion, you would see waves traveling from one end of a guitar string to another, and they're going over the top of each other all the time. Right? Some of those particular wavelengths form standing waves if they just happen to be the right size, right? and you know the sizes. Right? So if this is the length of the string, the wave that just happens to be twice as big, the wave that just happens to be exactly the right size, um, one and a half, two, there are some ones, there are some waves that are just the right size to have a node where it's unable to move, right? and an anti-node in the middle or a couple of anti-nodes or whatever. And those ones end up still traveling across the string through each other, but they end up looking like they're just doing this, and they're standing waves. And because of that particular fit, their amplitudes keep on adding up to each other because the antinode of one is right on the antinode of another one pretty much at all times. Right? 
And so they end up being the big waves that you end up hearing. They're the ones that actually move the air so much that you hear that note. Right? There's a lot of other things dancing around on a guitar string as well, but you don't hear them because they don't resonate. Right? So to put that in words, some particular wavelengths um, make standing waves. Right? Their crests are amplified and it's those ones which make the sound. That's, one, that's the one sentence version of what I said. These waves have got a <clears throat> have got the wavelength of 2L on N, where N equals 1, 2, or 3. That's basically the, the mathematics behind the things that I just drew. And because they form standing waves, their frequencies are said to be resonant, right? They are resonating. Um, something, something that resonates gets larger and larger and sort of matches because it matches the frequency of something else. Okay, that's the end of this file, my friends. I've got five more questions and I'm going to put them in another file, which I'll do, do next.